My name is Aran Yanai. I'm an engineering manager at Whistler, which is, was recently acquired by Palo Alto Networks. And today I'm going to talk with you about how to handle so many concurrent connections in Go. The purpose of this talk is to show you what it takes to deal with so many concurrent connections. When we scale up to such a high number, we are going to face multiple issues from many different directions. Some of them are as a result of limitations with the language itself, or maybe naive usage of it. Some of them are going to be operating system limitations, and others will be hardware limitations, such as memory usage limitations. It's quite a technical, hands-on talk, so I'm going to show you a series of issues, of troubles that we'll face at every step in the way, and eventually I'll show you a live demo uh, that demonstrates such a high scale. So let's start with a simple example of uh, a web server. So similar to many other languages, it consists of routes and handlers. In this case, we have the hello handler, which, when called, simply returns a simple hello gopher constraint to the user. And in the main function, I'm associating it with the main route of my server. I'm starting to, live, uh, to listen over port 8000. And every time when a client will send a request to my server, he will get the response from my handler. Behind the scenes, the way it works is that we have the serving function, which is called once we start listening. And what it does, it's waiting for incoming connections, accept, accepting them, and then for every incoming connection, it sets up a Go routine and calls the handler that we previously associated. So for every incoming connection, we have the Go routine that is calling the hello handler from before. So what is a WebSocket? So WebSockets provide a way to maintain a full duplex, persistent connection between a client and a server that both parties can start sending data at any time with low overhead and latency. So how does it work? The process starts with the client sending an HTTP request to the server with the upgrade header included. This informs the server that it wishes to establish a WebSocket connection. Then the server, if it supports the WebSocket protocol and wishes to upgrade the connection, it will reply with, to the client with the upgrade header included, mentioning that it supports the upgrade, and at this point, the handshake is complete, and either parties, either the client or the server, can send data at any time with low overhead and latency. So how do we do it in Go? So the first thing that we do, we go to the official documentation, and then we see that the WebSocket package in, in the Go language is not fully implemented. And it says that it lacks some features, and it's better to use an alternative library, which is more actively maintained, the Gorilla WebSocket library. So let's see an example of how to use it. So on the right, it's similar to what we had before, just that this time we associate the WebSocket function as the handler for the main route of our application. On the left, we start with initializing the upgrader interface, which is part of the third-party WebSocket library, and we give it the HTTP request, which in turn will, will return to us uh, some wrapper to the Netcon in interface in Go, which we can then use to read and write messages from the client. So in this example, all I'm doing, I'm upgrading the connection, and then I'm repeatedly going to read messages from the client and print them to the standard output. So in this example and in all the other examples in this talk, this is what I'm going to do. I only to simplify things, I will just get messages from the client and print it to the standard output. So let's quickly demonstrate it. Is it good enough on the back? No? Maybe this way. So now I'm starting the server. And I have a small, not important, implementation of the client, which I just tell it to initialize, say, 10 connections. It will open 10 connections, and now it sends messages from to the server. The server reads them, brings them to the standard output. So, OK, so it's just 10 connections, right? And we are talking about a million. So can anyone guess 
at what point we will face the first bump in the road, like the first issue. Okay, so let's try to open up, say, 2,000 connections. So the first problem that we face is that we get this error of originating from the accept call, which has too many open files. So the too many open files is an error that we get from the accept call, and the reason for this is that every resource in Linux is eventually represented by a file descriptor. Okay, this can be standard output, standard input, an open file to the disk, and uh, a socket connection. Everything in Linux is eventually represented by a file descriptor. And the reason for this error is that the operating system needs memory to manage each open file. And memory is a limited resource, so it is capped to some reasonable value. And um, the maximum number of open files is something that we also can change. It's just a recommendation. And using the ULIMI tool, we can see that we can see every resource in the system that we have and the, the pre-configured uh, resource limit limits for it. Among them is the, uh, right in the middle, it's the open files, which is set in most distros to 1,024 open files. And when we try to open 2,000 connections, each connection is represented by a socket connection, which is represented by a file descriptor, which above 10, above 1,000 will start uh, producing errors. So a few more things to know about ULimit is that it provides control over the resources available to, to, to processes, and it's, it's set per process. And actually, the, the kernel enforces both a soft limit and the hard limit to every corresponding resource, where the soft limit access the actual limitation, but it's sort of a suggestion, and we have the hard limit, which is a ceiling for the soft limit, and any process, privileged or unprivileged, can raise the soft limit up to the hard limit. And of course, a privileged process can do what it wants and make any arbitrary change. The specific resource that is interesting to us is the hard limit no file, which, is, which stands for number of open files. And it is the one that is enforcing the maximum number of open files. So as I said, we can change it. We can change it using new limit, but we can also change it directly in Go. So and there are two important syscalls that we need to, to get familiar with. The first one is the getter limit syscall, which allows us to fetch the, the resource limitations per the API is per resource. So in this example, I'm going to first call the getter limit, get the current limitations. Then I'm going to raise the current, which is the soft limit, and set it to the max, which is the hard limit. And then I'm going to call the setter limit to, to make the change. So let's quickly see the change. Yeah. So same as before, on the, on the top I'm going to start the server. And just to quickly, oops, just, to, just to make sure, let's try to open up, um, say, 2,000 connections. You can see that they all connect, they all work, they send messages that are being read by the server. So let's try to scale up a little bit. Let's try to open up 50,000 connections, for example. Um, so I will talk about it in the end, but I have some kind of uh, a wrapper script to the client, which I just tell it to open up 10,000 connections per instance for a total of five instances. So from now on, I'm not going to print to the standard output the, the messages from the client. Oh, God, wait. Yeah, I still do. <laughs> um, OK. So now I want to take your attention to this. I want to show you the resources used, used by, our, by our application. So um, 
don't know how well you can see this, but for 50,000 connections, we are already using about one gig of RAM. CPU usage is about 10, 20%, doesn't matter too much and makes sense. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. So, top is a nice way to to get a basic understanding, to get, like, it's it's very quick and simple way to get a good understanding about, okay, so it uses this amount of memory and CPU, but I want to have a better understanding because 50,000 connections are already using one gig of RAM. It's too much for me, and I want to see how I will be able to improve it to go further. So for this, I, go, I want to quickly go over Piprof. So Piprof is a, is a way to debug our, like, to have a good analysis of our uh, heap usage, uh, go routines, uh, and see exactly what the application is doing. It's a built-in package in Go. It uses HTTP handlers to serve profiling data that we can then consume using the Piprof tool and visualize it in a simple way. Using it is very simple. The first thing that we must do is import the Piprof package. It basically calls the init function of the Piprof package, which, which registers the Piprof uh, profiling routes and handlers. And in case we doesn't, we and in case we need, we need to also listen for using the regular HTTP with the regular, with the default MOOCs. And at this point, we can just make the following calls. I, will, I want to demonstrate two things. I want to demonstrate heap memory analysis to show you exactly what is using and allocating all this memory. So for this, we can just run the command uh, go tool pprof pipro to the specific route of debug pprof heap. And similarly, I will also show you a small analysis of all the goroutines that we have in the system and what each of them is doing. So, so I, I have, a, like I wrapped it with a small script, so I have people of goroutines. So this now, it, it reached out to my server, and now I can run the web command, which is going to start this SVG output, which shows us in, a useful information about goroutines. So we can see here that we have a total of 50,000 goroutines and slightly more. And they all originate from the serving function that is the root of our server application. And we can see that they all part of the server HTTP, which then calls the WebSocket handler that we defined. And then what they are all doing is trying to read messages from the clients, and eventually, most of the time, they will be idling or asleep, waiting for new data to arrive. The second thing that I want to show you is the heap analysis, which is far more interesting. So, it's quite cluttered, right? And an easy way to look at it quickly is to go with the red passes in the, in the output. So we can see that we are using about 700 megabytes. And they are all allocated from the serving function, which is then split to three main passes, each of them allocating about 200 megabytes. So the first pass is the, as a result of the HTTP handler itself the HTTP package, which is allocating a buffer reader, calling it the new buffer IO reader, which is then allocating a four kilobytes buffer. You also have another allocation, which is the buffer IO writer, which also allocates a 4K buffer, which is somewhere out there, yeah. So it's another 4K buffer. And then we have a third pass, which is as a result of the serving function, which is calling the WebSocket handler, which is then calling the upgrade mechanism to upgrade the connection, which during hijack is allocating another writer buffer of four, KB, of four kilobytes. So I want to formulate it to some kind of a function to 
for me it helps me to have a better understanding of exactly what my memory usage looks like and then I can have a better understanding of what I need to improve. So we already seen that every connection basically requires a go routine. It also has the buffers allocated from the NetHTTP package and the buffer allocated from the Gorilla WebSocket library. Right, because every, for every incoming uh, connection, we have the WebSocket handler. It is responsible for the first two. And then we call the upgrade mechanism, which allocates the third one. What it means, it means that serving a million concurrent connections would eventually consume about 20 gigs of RAM. So I want to talk about optimi optimizations. Basically, if we could optimize the number of go routines or somehow optimize the object allocations done by the HP package, or just reuse the allocated buffers across the different web sockets, we will be able to reach to a solution that its memory usage is not dramatically affected by the magnitude of the number of uh, open connections that we have. So the first optimization that I want to show is the, how to optimize the number of uh, concurrent routines that we have. And when talking about handling multiple concurrent connections, we have more or less uh, two or three approaches to, to, handling, to handling them. And the first approach is the routines, which is what we've just seen, which is the naive approach that we probably most of us take for uh, different uh, or simple uh, scenarios where we, for every incoming connection, we allocate a go routine, which is then simply reading the messages from within. It's an, a very simple approach, but in scale, as you've seen, it's, uh, it's going to consume a lot of resources. The different approach is, uh, is uh, relying on the fact that if we know when a data exists on the wire, we won't need to spend the go routine just to uh, continuously trying to read from the connection. We will be able to reuse the go routines and then reduce the memory footprint. And select poll and epoll, they are all ways to do async IO in Linux. And the motivation with async IO in Linux is very simple. You can say that you can tell to the kernel, here I have this amount of connections, and then just tell me what, when one of them is ready. And then I can just allocate one go routine or a few. It uh, depends on the implementation. And then once the, con the connection is ready for reading data from, I can then allocate a go routine or give it to a worker or something similar. So the usage with select is quite simple and straightforward. We have the select syscall, which accepts the FDs, which is uh, just an array of integers which, where each integer represents a file descriptor. And then we call the, when the, se the select call returns, it, it will simply set each of the file descriptors that is ready to use. We can then use some helper functions to detect which of them are ready, which are not, and then we can consume the data from the specific ready connections. The problem with select and poll, they are both implemented in a very similar way, is that it's very simple to use. It's good for a, uh, for simple situations of tens of connections, but anything above it, and it will, uh, its performance degrades uh, significantly. Apple, on the other hand, is a scalable solution to do async IO. Its performance is nearly constant, no matter what the size of the amount of connections that we are trying to use it for. The usage is quite simple. First, we will use we will call the epoll create, which allocates a new epoll instance. Then for every incoming connection, we are going to call the epoll control, adding the connection for poll in, poll up, which means uh, for incoming data or if the connection dis uh, disconnected or reset. And then every time that we call epoll wait, the call is blocking and it, is, and it will return once there is data ready to be read by at least one of the connections. So the results of EPOL are quite significant. It will allow us to reduce the, the go routine per connection. And theoretically, it would also allow us to 
reduce the buffer allocations by the HP package. So from 20 gigs, we are already down by five, six, seven gigs. I don't know how much exactly. But I want to show you how to take even far, it even further, because it's still a lot of memory for me. So the second optimization that I want to show you is the buffer allocations. Because when, if I am already doing async I.O., and I don't really need buffer per connection, because I can maybe use just one buffer, reuse it across all of them, or maybe a set of buffers, or a small buffer pool. I don't need a buffer per every connection. So this code snippets is part of the hijack call. <coughs> and the problem, <coughs> sorry, the problem with it is that first you can see in the middle that it allocates the buffer, which is the third buffer that we've seen in the PPROF output earlier. <coughs> and when returning the connection, it also keeps references to the reader and writer buffers from the HTTP package. And I don't want it, right? I, I, because I want to use just a single buffer or a small amount of buffers. And for this, I want to introduce to you to an alternative, which is a, <coughs> a different library called GoBoss. It's an excellent alternative WebSockets library in Go. Its specialty is that it's written in a very optimized and highly performant way. It allows us to do very advanced stuff, like it does no intermediate allocations during I.O. It has zero copy upgrades. It has a better low-level API, which allows us to do, like, to build better building logic around packet handling. Using it is quite simple. The, like, the switch from, the, from one to the other is quite simple. On the left is the WebSocket handler, which, instead of using the upgrader from the previous library, then we call the upgrade HTTP from this library. It was the same. It returns a netcon connection interface, not some kind of wrapper, but it's OK. On the right, we have the specific Go routine that we have allocated for just detecting and reading data from the connection, which is just using the WebSocket util package, which is also part of this library. So let's see a demo. I'll stop this one. Okay. So so I'm now using the I have also the EPOL implementation. So I'll run it. Um, so I want to show you one more thing. So let's try and scale up all the way to <coughs> about 250,000 connections, and then I will show you something more. So, so I'll open up 20,000 connections per instance, and I will need, say, 12 instances. And it quickly goes up. So in this case, I really, I, as I mistakenly said before, I don't print out the messages from the clients. I do read them to show real usage, but I don't print them because it will just clutter the output. So we already have 240,000 connections. <coughs> now I want to <coughs> show you this. Um, I want to show you the output of my kernel log. <coughs> and now I want to open up another, I know, say all the way up to 300,000 connections. Doesn't matter much. So you can see it still goes up. <coughs> and right about 260,000 connections, I'm starting to see errors in my kernel log saying something like NF contract, contract table is full, drop in packet. So what does it mean? So the final bump in the road is contract table. And just in a sentence or two, contract table is uh, a mechanism in Linux to track the existing connections that we have in our server. It is, it basically, it, it just holds a, an information per source, destination, source port, desk port, and so on for every established connection. And it's used by various mechanisms, such as for IP tables, for firewalling, and so on. 
And it is limited to a value of about 262,000, I, I don't remember exactly, on most distros. And the reason for the limitation is that, at least one reason, is that uh, eventually any ordinary server or Ubuntu machine probably doesn't need to open to so many connections. But in this case, I want to push it up a little further. And in many cases, seeing so many concurrent connections on a machine <coughs> probably means, or at least could mean, that there is a potential denial of service attack on my server. And also, due to some memory resources, limitations, and requirements, it is limited to about 260,000 connections. So similar to many other things in Linux, we can change it. And we can change it simply by writing some, file, some value to some file. So if we take a look at the the small script that I have here, we simply can output a new number to proxies, net filter, and contact max, which is the maximum size of the contact table. And if I will now apply it, I can carry on and open more connections. So I will need another, I don't know, say 14 instances, I guess. Now, behind the scenes, you might, might wonder, um, I'm using Docker to leverage uh, something called network namespaces to open so many concurrent connections. If you see, you can see that I'm doing it all in a single VM on my laptop. And <coughs> there's something called the ephemeral port range in Linux, which basically when you open up an outgoing connection, you get allocated with some kind of, with, with a port, in, with the source port in this range. It's a range that is limited to about 30,000 ports. And I'm opening here like a million connections. Yeah. So I'm opening so many connections. And if I, have a, I can only open up about 30,000. So I'm leveraging Docker to run each client in a separate uh, network namespace, which means that I can then, for every instance, allocate about 30,000 connections. I limit it to about 20,000 just because it's not too much uh, optimized, the client, and then it goes slow as the number goes up, so I just open up a few more instances. Um, so now let's take a look at the uh, top, top output again. Uh, and we can see that we are only at about 700 megabytes of RAM. The CPU usage is a bit higher, of course, because it's an handling so many connections, so it makes sense. So, <coughs> so now we're standing with a memory allocation that is much more linear to the num number of connections, and we managed to reduce the memory usage by about 97%. We started with about 20 gigs of RAM with quite a naive solution. We then did some tricks, some optimizations, and we reached about six, 600, 700 megabytes. So just to recap, um, of course, you might say, I know, a million connections and premature optimization is the root of, a, of all evil, but if we must. So we used, first we used UE limit to increase the cap, the, 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 cap, the, the cap of the no file, the number of open files resource. We then reached a, a, over a thousand connections. We then used ePOL to do async I.O. and to reduce the high load of Go routines of our application. We then sw switched to GoWAS to have a more performant, li performant library that allows us to reduce further the buffer allocations. And lastly, we, we modified the contract table to increase the cap of the total concurrent connections in the operating system. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>